we had wrapped up, we're just going to jump right into the Word today. Um, we had wrapped up a four-part series out of Psalm 23. And the last two kind of key points that we looked at was this idea that God would prepare a table in the presence of, of the enemy, and we're applying this now through a Christian lens, right? And so God prepares a table, and we don't just feast, we also serve. And so there's a, a physical metaphor that gives us a powerful spiritual truth, but then it brings us back to the physical again. So not only does it prepare a table, and again, the Christian application would be to do ministry, and we are surrounded by those who would want to destroy us for proclaiming the gospel, right? Not for believing the gospel. You're not going to take any heat for that. You're not going to get martyred for believing the gospel. You're going to get martyred or get into trouble or have to count the cost for what you do as a Christian, which is kind of what we're talking about today, when you begin to broadcast or proclaim the gospel. So we want to look at that. But this is a physical metaphor, spiritual application, and then physical consequences. And you go like, how can I, how can I do ministry? And then, you know, David had taught us, well, there's an anointing too. And yes, on one hand, it's the, it's the spirit in your life, but it is also the enabling for the moment. Right? Even this morning, I was reminded of the concept another preacher used where he talked about getting in your lane and just focusing on your lane. You need anointing for your lane. And perhaps we'll come back to that. So, But the reality is, are there consequences for enjoying a relationship as depicted in Psalm 23? Are there physical consequences? And there absolutely are. And that's really what we're looking at today. Because not only are we warned about the consequences, but we are told, before you embark, okay, count the cost. Before you embark on ministry, before you go from being a, a gospel receiver, I'm excited about this, I have eternal life. And that's a biblical principle. You come, you see, you learn, you grow, and then you say, you know what, I want to serve. So you come and you see and you grow and then you serve. But there comes a point where you absolutely have to count the cost, and that's what we're talking about here today. And I was reminded, even in my own life, I, most of my Christian life, I, I went into ministry, or at least began to pursue it, and actually as a very young believer. But even my, my first exposure where I decided I want to be in ministry, and whether that's a missional, vocational, or serving your neighborhood, don't, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean whether I wanted to be funded by somebody or no. Whether I wanted to step out and be an aggressive servant. We had a guest speaker come to our church who had spent a number of years in the jungles of Papua New Guinea, and he had a challenge. And the challenge was simply this. There are tribal groups. There are people waiting in the jungles of Papua New Guinea and other places on a waiting list for missionaries. Now, I have grew up right here in Simi Valley 27 years. No one ever invited me to church. No one ever really shared the gospel with me until those special friends did that help bring me to Christ. So I kind of had a, a spot in my heart for those that had never heard. But was I mature enough at the time to count the cost? Probably not. I have to admit, kind of ran off a little bit quick. But I just want to share with you the letter that triggered my heart. This was written and translated, so if it seems a little choppy and odd, it, it is being translated from one language to another. But it does capture the heart. This was written by a native in a distant village. I have two letters here, actually. Asking for missionaries. And this is what he said. He says, now I'm here writing to you. Do you remember our talk, our meeting? You're a leader, you must listen well. If you're a leader, you'll help us. That is why we're talking to you. Are you a trick leader or what? If you're a leader, listen to us ones of Sabamin. We try and try, but you do not listen. Are you of God or crazy? Everywhere, in every place, the talk of God is there. Why not us? Talk to the leaders of your church and send us someone. Don't give your backsides to us. Are you clear on what I'm saying here or not? We have a huge desire for a missionary to come and serve and live in our village and jungle. I am Arus Nakibisap, the writer. Another one, I'll explain more a little. This one hits home a little more for me. Another tribal letter says, what's going on? Where is our help? Have you forgotten about us? We have not forgotten about wanting a missionary. We carry a huge heavy constantly about this. We carry this heavy because we fear for our lives. We know the Bible says that you should come and tell us. Us dark ones need it. How will we go to God's place if not? Only those who know will go. How will we know if no one teaches us? That is the whole of my story. We want a missionary now to come and give us God's talk. 
for me and, and for my wife, and there were some dynamics that came into play, but that was it. We were ready to go. We were ready to take our three young boys, sell our house. We didn't think about counting the cost. We were ready to run off at 100 miles an hour, but for, we're grateful for training programs and discernment programs because honestly, we were not mature enough to make those decisions as a year and a half believer in Christ. We just weren't. But at the time, we had a church that was excited and God was just doing wonderful things. And we went through a four-year training program and then we got over there and you know what? Maybe a little bit more mature, not a whole lot. Seems to come slow for me. <laughs> I'm kidding. And we counted the costs later and made some ministry decisions, and I'll come back to that. But that's what we're talking about today, staring at the reality of ministry and counting the costs. Another example, and Jesus will get into this in our text a little bit today. I think it was around 1990, 91, where Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and he failed to count the costs of the American response. Probably thought we wouldn't do anything, and when we began to set up our army or do our thing, he once again failed to count the cost. He took 150 of his tanks and he buried them in the desert, ready to unload on American troops. Planes would fly over and didn't even see them. But unbeknownst to them, we have spy planes with heat sensors. And from 70,000 feet up, they detected heat patterns in the desert shaped like tanks, forwarded the radar locks, and needless to say, the tanks were removed. Saddam Hussein failed to calculate the cost. That's really what we're talking about here today as we return to the Gospel of Luke. And let's just do a recap for a minute here. Okay, just stand back and go, what, what have we learned in Luke and what leads us up to where we are today? Good review, but also what is the absolute essential key in Bible study is context. And so what we're doing now is we are trying to, we're going to recapture the context here just for a minute. Now even before Luke chapter 1, what was God doing? He had gone silent for 400 years. But not before Daniel the prophet actually gave our Hebrew friends a timeline. They knew the timeline. In fact, if we go back and read their ancient writers, we can find out they were expecting and they developed committees. Those committees had strategies and rules for how to go investigate a possible messianic figure. Yes, they were absolutely ready. Then out of nowhere, this odd duck by the name of John comes bebopping out of the wilderness and begins to indict Israel. He says, you guys actually are absolutely corrupt. You're wrong. You're presuming on promises to the nation, not to yourself. You've missed a lot here. His message to them was that you have to repent. You have to rethink where you're at. And again, repentance is not an external cleaning of the person for acceptance. No, God goes so much deeper than that. He wants to penetrate hearts with truth. Repentance is a change of mind and heart, which is a synonym in the scriptures, a change of your disposition, not a quick fix. Genesis 15:6. Abram believed the Lord, and his faith was credited to him as righteousness. I mean, if there was a founding truth, a founding truth for our Hebrew friends, for our Jewish, Jewish friends, friends, that would be it. But they dismissed it. They wanted to jump through hoops. They wanted to be ceremonially externally clean. They wanted to add rules. They just completely set aside that precious truth that a lost sinner can believe a message from God and that faith is then reckoned to his account as righteousness. And the Apostle Paul uses that same verse to defend the biblical position that the Christian is also righteous, having done nothing good on his own. It's an alien righteousness. And what a shame for so many follow our pharisaical Hebrew friends and put that on the shelf and presume to pursue that righteousness on their own, the consequences were horrible. Their religious system was corrupt. Their doctrine was corrupt. Their disposition was corrupt. And judgment was coming if they didn't change their mind. And then you just picture John out at this river, just, just hammering on people. We're wrong, we're wrong. And then he stops dead in his track. And up walks a guy that I'm going to presume was relatively unassuming. He probably looked the same. He probably smelled the same. Dirty robe, sandaled feet. And John says, that's him. This is the one I'm telling you about. That's the Lamb of God right there who takes away the sins of the world. And there was Yeshua, or Jesus, the Nazarene. Our Jewish friends, oh, they sent their committees, they began all their procedures, but he simply did not fit the bill. He was so graceful, loving, compassionate, 
kind. He didn't speak a hard word hardly to anybody. He spoke of religious humility, not accolades. It's not about what you do. You're just a bunch of dead skeletons getting all fancy. He spoke to the heart. And at his will, the blind could see, the lame could walk. He raised the dead. He stepped into the person of God and forgave sins. I mean, a guy comes through the roof. And Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. Oh, and then he heals them. He did not fit the bill because any of the lowest of societies could come and openly, no Jewish hoops, no religion, no polishing up, no nothing. They could simply come and worship him and he loved them immensely. His only harsh words were for those that would self-elevate themselves in a religious realm. In order to self-elevate, you have no no choice but to push off. And in my experience, albeit limited, you end up pushing off of other precious souls to elevate yourself. Those are the ones that Jesus had harsh words for. He didn't speak harshly to Pontius Pilate. He didn't speak harshly to those who drove the nails through his now human body. In fact, he prayed for people like that. And we see some of them come to faith too. He warned against hypocrisy. He wanted the simple, the broken, who would just come to him kneeling in true, authentic need. And when they did, they received the forgiveness of sins. No Jewish hoops, no nothing. In response, the religious leaders went after him like nothing else. They empowered themselves by a devilish plot to take him down. They went after him with everything they had, empowered by Satan himself, and Jesus simply turned it around as a teaching opportunity for the 12 and for us. When Israel's rejection became obvious, it became so complete, he began to shift gears and intentionally develop these 12 men for a worldwide gospel proclamation. And what we had been learning and looking at prior to taking a little break in Psalm 23 was their training. And he began to speak of his death and of his return. If you're paying attention, all of a sudden the scriptures make so much more sense because there's so much prophecies that now come into light for all of us. But before he would leave, he had to train and empower these men because these very same tendencies that would trip up Israel, this idea of external religion to make you feel better, it leads to hypocrisy. It spreads like leaven, or we might say it spreads like mold on fruit bowl. It just doesn't stop. He warned about greed and covetousness because the very same thing, rather than be in heaven, we want to circumvent that joy with good, fun stuff. Some of that's good, but Jesus warned us to guard against greed. You cannot do ministry when you're greedy. He spoke of readiness. He spoke of having your lamps lit. He spoke of waiting on the edge for his return. He spoke of faithful Christians who would be rewarded. He warned against unfaithful Christians. There will be a in the family of God, judgment, so to speak, for the Christian too. That's not heaven and hell. That's been solved at the cross. But if you are going to abuse this, there will be consequences. Summed up, these 12 would again launch on a worldwide mission that cost them and millions after them their lives. Many, many died and continue to die torturous death since its founder jesus christ was tortured and crucified christians have been slaughtered in droves we ended off in luke six weeks ago whatever it was with this idea that that the jewish friends didn't want to come to the messianic feast right and so jesus gave this parable no no you go out and you invite everyone else then and they went out and they invited and they came back no no there's still more room go everybody's invited and they could come to this free feast. That's a metaphor once again for evangelism. Well, what he's going to do today is he's going to warn you, if you're going to proclaim the free gift to the world, you just went from Bible believer to Bible proclaimer. And there is a huge difference. It's like studying the scriptures is one thing. Yeah, go teach someone the scriptures. Watch the opposition that will come. So the question for us then is, are we willing to pay the price, not for our salvation, pay the price that proclaiming the free gift to other people will bring. Christians have been murdered in droves for proclaiming the freeness of the gospel. And so really the question is, 
Where are we warned about it? Where are we cautioned? Join me, Luke chapter 14. Let's take a look here. In verse 25, where it starts off, you have the, the invitation to the feast and so forth. And then in verse 25, it says, Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Okay, and again, context drives the interpretation of this. So you have to go back into that original context. What was Luke trying to get them to understand when he wrote this? Luke's trying to capture Jesus' heart, and I can assure you he did capture it when he spoke these things. So what would they have understood? Well, they've seen the miracles. The blind can see, the lame can walk. Jesus drew a massive crowd. And now he speaks of this feast, pretty logical. Oh, and two or three people are raised from the dead. You know, that kind of stuff draws a crowd. But as we saw, he is locked into the cross. Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He's going to die. And so you have this crowd here. It's like, the miracles are cool. The food's awesome. It's like, this is cool. And so Jesus stopped and went, You guys need to know what's involved here. This isn't a joke. This isn't a game. You aren't following me to see if I raise somebody up out of the ground. If you're going to follow me, if you're going to be a part of this movement, active part of this movement, then you've got to have your priorities straight. And he goes on to say a couple things that really kind of rock us. Like verse 26, really hate your father and your mother. And you go, well, isn't that kind of in the Ten Commandments that we're actually supposed to? to love them of course it is and again we want to look at this through the lens of that early group that got this they would have understood the jewish idiom there it is simply a preference you cannot pursue these radical ministries if you do not have a priority in your life so if you could stare at your mom and your dad and you love them to death and they were there your whole life and you're just absolutely convinced you know i just that's fine then But if you're going to venture out, if you're going to get radical, especially in that first century, you'd better be willing to die and you had better be willing to in lieu of spending out your parents' golden years, right? You have to decide if you're going to do this. You have to count the cost of following it. And if it doesn't come up where, you know what, I'm willing to die. I'm willing to see my kids go off to a dorm school. I'm willing to have my grandkids raised on the foreign mission field, or I'm willing to stay on the field while they're... Whatever the case might be, I'm even willing to die for this. Well, then you might want to slow down a little bit. Maybe this isn't for you, this radical lifestyle. And then he continues on in verse 27. He says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple at that point he's focused on his own cross but they would have seen roman crucifixion if you can't handle what i'm going to go through you don't want in on this movement so yes we were warned continue to continue to consider these things and then he gives a little bit of a parable he says in verse 28 he says for which one of you when he wants to build a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it that's just common sense don't embark on something right and here's what happens i say this carefully because it's one of those things that's true but you never know how somebody's thinking about it when you agree with it but you get excited about something, you're challenged with something, like going and raising your kids in the middle of the jungle, and you don't count the cost, you just run off 100 miles an hour, well, you quit in the middle of it, and you create quite a disaster. That's what he's saying, is don't do that. Count the cost, figure it out in advance. You can't bury 150 tanks in the sand when the United States has a U-2 spy plane. <laughs> there they are, kaboom! Well, it's the same thing. You can't say, well, God's sovereign. He's sovereign, and I'm going here and there. Well, he is, but the text is telling you to sit down and stare some facts in the face and be careful. You don't just run off immature and half-baked. It'd be the same thing for this new couple. They have a couple kids, and they've gone from a little apartment, they've saved a down payment, and now they're ready to buy a house. Do you just go out and blindly buy whatever house looks good to you, or do you not sit down, look at your down payment, you look at your interest rate, you calculate some costs, and then you go, you know, I don't think we can do that house. We better do this instead. Where does the intersection of us counting the cost, and really this is all about wisdom here in a sense, right? Where does that cross us counting the, the cost and the sovereignty of God? Let me fast forward, or rewind, 
Again, we, we respond to those letters. God and his grace and, and our church at the time and a number of other churches got behind us. We went through four years of training and then another year here just gearing up. And we went over there. Now we were just a little bit more mature. And we did. And we sat down with leadership there. There's, there's those that want to go to the most remotest place. Okay, a helicopter's $1,000 an hour. Did you have the churches behind you to fund that? Building an airstrip could be a $150,000 investment to clear the ground. And did, did, did you count those costs? Well, for us, it wasn't that. On this four-year journey, my son struggled immensely with some, some lung issues and different things, the mold, and here we are in the jungle. And I began to see, I do not want to be part of some massive joint thing going deep into the jungle and not be able to finish what I started. So we counted the costs. We saw the needs on the mission field. And God used a number of relationships with tribal people and missionaries. And there was another missionary who had to step out of his role. We stepped into it and we joined a team that was planning a church amongst the Sino people of Papua New Guinea. And we spent years there. The health struggles were real. And when we came home, just a real quick note on the sovereignty of God here, because I don't want to dismiss it, but I don't want us presuming on it. We came home and I had a chance to share in a couple churches. And I thought, you know, share the letters. Share the letters that had really triggered my heart. And so I pulled them out of an old file and I sat there absolutely floored and realized one of those letters was from Sino Village that God had sovereignly led us to in as we applied the word of God, as we counted the cost, as we scaled back the idea of being the most radical, groundbreaking missionary in the world. We were wise, we counted the cost, and the very letters that God used to stir our heart, completely unbeknownst to us, the letters were always in my heart. Who wrote them was not. I lived in the village that wrote the letter that challenged me to the mission field. I had no idea. And I went back there after getting healthy and I, the story gets a little better, at least for me. And I asked, who wrote this letter? And as it turns out, my son's best childhood friend there, who's also now a pastor in that church, it was his grandfather had written the letter. And the whole thing tied together. So as much as we're talking about the human side of ministry here, we don't want to miss out that God is doing his side, okay? We're counting the cost. It's like pulling into your lane. I talked about that earlier. Got it from another pastor. You have your lane. You have your calling. And in order to be as effective as you can with that, you need to count the cost. Simple as that. Then in verse 29, it says, Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation, he's not able to finish. All who observe it begin to ridicule him. Like, what are you doing? You just presumed on God's provision. You presumed he was going to send a couple thousand dollars a month for a helicopter. You presumed he was going to fund your building. You presumed you could go out and borrow two million dollars to build a new church. But did you count the cost? And that's the idea. And you make Christianity look really bad. Or he says, what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he's strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. And he says, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. <laughs> Whoa, that's a real zinger too. It's going to cost you dearly. And the reality is, as we look back through not only our own history as Christians, I mean, how many things were you passionate about and like, then you forgot about it, right? You never saw it through. And I'm not saying they all had a negative impact, but that's what we're talking about here today. I remember after World War II, uh, uh, the Doolittle Raid, I think Doolittle recently passed away, but he literally led these group of young pilots. They launched after the attack on Pearl Harbor. They launched off of an aircraft carrier because they felt it was absolutely essential to just return some of those bombs to Tokyo. Let them know we're in the dance now, if you will. And those men left on that aircraft carrier knowing this had never been done before and they would not land on that aircraft carrier. Some probably hoped for landing in China and were saved, others died. But they counted the cost and they said, you know what, we were attacked, this is warfare, our family depends on it, we're willing to pay the price. And they launched and men died. Same thing with the, the team that went after Osama bin Laden. You interview those guys after the fact and they're like, yeah, we totally get it. This is a suicide mission. It was by the grace of God. Not everyone finishes their ministry well. This is just a pep talk, guys. Not a condemning thing. It's a pep talk. 
But see, the simple fact is nowhere does the New Testament take it for granted that God is sovereignly going to see what you start through or that you're even going to finish it. Finish discipleship to the end. You take someone like Mark, the Gospel of Mark, John Mark. He was actually bailed on Paul and Barnabas. He was the source of these two missionary church planners who did ministry together. They separated. And you never read in the New Testament that they ever got back together again in fellowship. Why? Because Mark had bailed on them. Mark failed to count the cost. Did he not aware of this parable? We don't know. The same thing is happening all the time. We set out on things. We presume on God. We're not prepared. We haven't counted the cost. We haven't sought the proper counsel. We haven't sought the proper funding. We haven't sought the proper prayer support. We haven't sought the proper blessing from our church. And we just get excited and run off at 100 miles an hour. And you know what? The consequences are real. And many times, if we're not careful, we actually make God look bad. And I want to talk about something else too. Is there's a really popular concept is that when we find something like challenging or difficult or warning in the scripture is that somehow we manage to tag it on the unbeliever. Right? As if this has anything to do with the gospel. That's not what he's talking about. He's preparing the 12 and he has these crowds. He's not going to let them blindly follow him. In the early church it was extremely dangerous to be a Christian. No, that's not what he's doing at all. That is not how his original recipients would have understood that. It's a caution to stay effective. I found a quote here by a Dr. Tom Constable. And he says this, he says, It is simply a theological illusion to maintain that a Christian who has embarked on the pathway of discipleship could never abandon it in the spiritual realm. The notion is as naive as an earthly father who declares my son would never drop out of school. The point is, is not only do we risk failing to grow as a disciple, as a student, but even the ministry itself will come crashing down around us. And to presume upon the sovereignty of God and to presume that we're simply going to do good because we're Christians, I think is dangerous. That's not the case at all. And again, this is one of those passages that I think gets a little bit abused and needs a band-aid. Here's what I mean. The goal of Bible interpretation is to understand the author's intent and then the other side to understand how the original recipients would have understood that letter. Did the original recipients understand that heaven and hell was conditioned upon this type of text? I mean, contrast that to the banquet invitation where anybody can come and drink free. And that's repeated in Revelation 22, 17, right? The spirit and the bride say, come, come and take freely this gift. It's free everywhere, proclaiming it's not free, hence the warning. But if you ever see when the context is either justification by faith or the gift of eternal life, such strong verbiage applied to an unbeliever. If this was, there are now four new conditions to believing in Jesus Christ. Gotta hate your mom and dad. I know they understood the idiom, but I mean, think about it. You heard about a guy raising the dead. You live somewhere on the back half of Damascus. You come marching over because you want to check this out. And all of a sudden, well, yeah, you gotta hate your mom and dad. You gotta, you gotta wow. He's a real hard one, isn't he? Okay, well. You've got to carry a cross. What exactly did that mean? And that You've got to be willing to die. Okay, so it's not about getting eternal life. It's about getting myself killed? Is that, is that what? I, I'm not sure how they would have understood that. How about you've got to follow Jesus around Palestine until he's, I mean, to follow me, that would have been the literal thing. If these are conditions for eternal life, like what? I mean, there's some things that radically changed. And then, yeah, you've got to give up everything. Does that sound like... John 3.16? It, it's different. Wednesday night, join us. 7 o'clock, we'll be sending out a Zoom link. What we're going to do is we're actually going to look at a concept we visited a couple years ago, but it's the idea, and it's a man-made idea by a, a theologian. I'll introduce you to him, his material. But he helps Christians understand the distinctions by labeling them A-truth and B-truth. So A-truth would be talking about the gospel itself, about the gift of eternal life, right? So under A-truth would be John 3.16, right? John 5.24, on and on and on. Under B-truth would be the challenges of discipleship. And once we realize, oh, you mean he's not talking about eternal life? In this case, no, he's not, not at all. Able to distinguish and rightly divide the Bible. So join us Wednesday at seven o'clock for that. So, but that brings us back to 
How do we then, not being in first century Palestine, you could be the most committed Christian here and not face any of this. And again, really, really common that well-intended Bible teachers somehow making you stand up for Jesus and get baptized qualify for this? Getting baptized is picking up your cross and following Jesus? Was it that difficult? What, how, how have we mitigated this down so low? What a low view of Scripture. And what a low view of Christian martyrs who follow Jesus Christ by doing exactly what this said. And we have the audacity to think making a commitment to Jesus and getting saved is the same thing. We were just totally butchering the text and then totally dishonoring those who have paid the price. So let's not, let's not dumb this down and think that we do this every day. This is absurd. I know, enough said, but it's so common. How then do we apply this text? Well, I do think two key areas. Are you a Bible believer, a gospel believer, or a gospel broadcaster? Because that's all you can do. You can only do what you can do. You don't invite extra nonsense and persecution. You just proclaim the message. And you know what? There's that sovereign side. I wanted to go be a missionary in the middle of the jungle. God had other plans. God has that lane for you. He has that calling. That's why you have the anointing David spoke of. But you can't force this stuff and don't pretend that sharing Jesus with your neighbors qualifies as picking up your cross. Don't do that. So how do we apply it? Open, aggressive, graceful gospel witnessing, right? Romans 12 says, having believed, having seen some very strong um, emancipation shoes, we're free from the law, we're free from the old man, we're, we're, we're just following the Holy Spirit and Jesus in life. And then Romans 12 says that we actually present ourselves to God. Here I am, alive from the dead, justified, forgiven, and dwelt by your spirit, and we're to be transformed by what? By Netflix? No, by the renewing of our mind. So we present ourselves to God, we dig into the scriptures, and we ask the question not, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will? What is he doing? And how do I join them in that? And then you know what? If that brings you a relatively comfortable ministry here and you're incredibly blessed, then you just keep in mind those that are not. But don't invite it on yourself by being obnoxious or claiming some persecution that isn't true. No. No. You just present yourself, eyes on Jesus. He's the Lord of hosts. He's in charge. Let him guide you and let him direct you. Your goal is, here I am, Lord, whatever it takes. And then be prepared. That will bring probably a little bit of a need for you to count some costs. It will. We have another opportunity, too, that I want to talk a little about because I think as we look at the sum total of Scripture, whether it be giving, not tithing in the New Testament, whether it be picking up this cross or, or being relatively comfortable doing ministry, there is still an underlying principle that I think makes this applicable. One is to pray for the martyrs, to be there with our brothers and sisters, but is to support gospel outreach ministries to the point where it makes you just a little uncomfortable. It's called living sacrificially. And we have a little bit of an opportunity here. Uh, the Lord laid some things on our heart about some Navajo Indians in Arizona that don't have the medical supplies. As soon as those casinos closed, the money was turned off. There's some people living there without basic utilities. And so if you would like to stretch yourself a little bit, pick up a little baby cross and say, you know what? I was going to do this, but I'm going to do this instead. That would be a fantastic application. I was going to buy the million dollar Learjet. I'm just going to lease one. I don't know. I'm being silly, but you get the idea. Why? Because there's a cause that's been entrusted to us. There are still people groups waiting for missionaries out there. And there are still people who don't have sanitizer and different things they need. And it's only eight hours away. So if you'd like to participate, you could, uh, you could memo a check to the church and, or you can call me. Um, people have bought supplies online. I'll be picking them up or they're drop shipping to my house. I'm going to get with Kate and Larry and we're probably going to end up making a run out there with some of those supplies. It's just a way to say, you know what? I'm not going to invite persecution. I'm not going to pretend sharing the gospel with my friend is persecution and I have to carry a cross. That's called Christianity. That's not carrying a cross but I'm going to sacrifice a little bit for a greater cause. And that maybe someone in the distant jungles of New Guinea or maybe some precious young girl on that Navajo Indian reservation will be a little more open to receive the gift, the free gift of eternal life in Jesus. So if you'd like to participate, fine. Again, reminder, we, you know, we don't 
uh, we don't just turn off all the bills because we're not in a facility. Sure, we're saving a little bit on rent during this, but if you want to continue to support our ministry, uh, whether you're part of Compass or someone around the world, you're invited to do that. Um, and we have all the information on how you can give online, mail in a check and so forth. So, all right, hey, join us Wednesday. We're going to look at this concept of A truth and B truth to figure out how we get them mixed up and what happens. I'll be sending out a Zoom link. And once again, guys, if there's anything that we can do, uh, as a church to love you and to serve you. If you have any questions, please do reach out to me. And so, Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for mercy. We thank you for the ministry of reconciliation and what that looks like, Lord, it looks so different. But would you guide each of us as we present ourselves to you? Would you do something amazing in and through us as individuals, but also as a church? Lord, we look forward to having a facility of our own. We look forward to, to the new normal, whatever you decide that's going to be. We pray for our funding for the new facility, the architectural plans, the city permits, everything is going on. Pray for some additional staff to relaunch this thing. And we're just so excited about what you're going to do, Father. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Call me if you guys need anything, okay? And I look forward to seeing you Wednesday. Thank you.